Okay, welcome everyone to Exceptional Circumstances for Exceptional Learners. I am Rebecca Muller and your host here today. Um, I am so excited to be able to introduce our presenters today. Um, as so many of us have been searching for resources and connections throughout the pandemic, I came across Ashley's work um, via a Facebook group. Um, she was collecting data for parents um, that needed to get services for their children through the pandemic. So it was a survey. Um, those of you ha who have been following the um, discussion group know that my own child is age two um, and currently has some speech delays. Um, so we have been and doing virtual speech and um, direct intervention ther therapy. In a few weeks, he's going to be getting an OT evaluation somehow in a virtual way. Um, and it's just not the same. Um, it's been very diff different for us. Um, my son has made a lot of gains. Um, and in some ways, although it's not the same, there has been some benefits because my husband and I are working more hands-on with him. We're spending a lot more time with him because frankly, we don't have a choice. <laughs> um, but it's been, um, you know, there's, there, there's been pros and cons. And so I'm, I'm really excited um, for them to share their, their work today um, and to also just connect the community of individuals out there who feel alone and during this time and realize that a lot of us are going through those those same things. Um, so the title of today is Raising Exceptional Children. And um, I will have Heather introduce herself first and followed by Ashley. Hi, I'm Heather Risser and I am assistant professor in the uh, Mental Health Services and Policy Program within Feinberg School of Medicine's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at Northwestern University. Um, and I'm also brought out by Lurie Children's Hospital as the Director of Research and Strategy in the Division of Child Abuse Pediatrics. I'm also the mom of a little boy, a six-year-old little boy with Down syndrome. So we've also, as you experienced it too, Rebecca, we are, I'm not only experiencing it from the research side and the policy side, but also from the personal side. So I think Ashley and I wanted to, to, to really try to figure out what is everyone's experience so that we can inform policy uh, in terms of where are some opportunities. Like you said, there are some opportunities here uh, that we want to really capitalize on and help to make that link between research and policy. Great, thank you. And Ashley? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ashley Murphy. I am a graduate student at Northwestern um, and I work with Heather, she previously mentioned. Um, I have been working with children and families um, with disabilities for over 10 years now in a variety of capacities, um, whether that was as a paraprofessional, a special education teacher, and now as a researcher. Um, I was a high school special education teacher when I first um, graduated from college, and I became really interested in related services. It's kind of this aspect of special education that we talk a lot about, or we talk about therapies a lot, but we don't always talk about related services and how important they are. Um, and I'm really interested in how little strategies, little therapeutic interventions that we can do here and there add up and make a huge difference for kids in the long run. Um, so after teaching, I was able to connect with Heather and we've been collaborating ever since, working on exploring this kind of little um, researched aspect of special education. Um, and I also am going to be starting to do more work with children with special health care needs in addition to just disabilities. So our kiddos with asthma, our kiddos with um, chronic illnesses, and any sort of need that requires some additional supports. That's wonderful. Um, and then you also have a personal connection as well, right, Ashley? 
I do. I have a younger brother who has dyslexia. He was not diagnosed until he was a sophomore in high school. And it was, I just remember growing up and watching his frustration, watching my parents' frustration, um, and just how kind of, not, not hopeless, but how overwhelming the process really felt to them. So what really inspired me to go down this track, specifically in clinical psychology, was just watching the rapid changes he was able to make when he started these therapies that helped him kind of regulate his emotions and be able to access his academic content better. Um, it just made such a huge difference and I've been really inspired ever since. Yeah, and I, I do think it's so important to point out that those who do much in policy and advocacy and the research, a lot of times it is because they are directly affected um, um, by a family mem member or maybe even them mm -hmm. themselves. Um, and then that's a really important connection to, to make um, so that we can continue to reach out to others um, so that they gain the understanding so that they can also uh, get on board to see how important this work is. All right, so we're going to get back to your presentation. Okay. So do you mind if I jump right in? Yeah, go for it. Awesome. So just to give you guys a heads up ahead of time, I really, really value input from the audience. So if there's anything that you find surprising or interesting or that you even disagree with, please feel free to speak up. This is really an opportunity for us to all gather and think about these topics and how they apply to our own work. Um, it seems that we have a couple of providers here. I'm not sure if we have any parents in the audience, um, parents and children with special needs, but I will do my best to gear the content towards both parents and providers so it can be of benefit to everyone. So a couple of things I wanted to talk about today is first and foremost, how parenting during COVID-19, what does it look like? What are some of these issues parents are experiencing um, beyond what we all already know personally as um, kind of the burdens of COVID-19? And then I also want to get into some other research I was able to do in the, the information that um, the special needs parent community so kindly shared with me. And then at the end, I have some tips for parents and providers that will hopefully help make the transition to, you know, I guess, remote learning for the foreseeable future or hybrid learning, whatever model we're in, a little more straightforward for everyone. And I do think when it comes to hybrid or full remote, we need to be so flexible mm -hmm. because it's going to constantly change. Our numbers are going to go down and then something is going to happen. And we need a, a, a plan that is flexible to kind of help us get through these next, hopefully year to two years or whatever it may be. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think the other thing, too, is um, this really is an opportunity for us to test a model or some different models that we can use long after the pandemic, right, for kids who might be going through chemo or even just have the flu, and they're at home, but they're missing speech, and they're missing PT and OT, um, and obviously, if they're sick in bed, they might not be up for PT, but there may be some things that we can still do to support them, especially if they're going to miss more than a week of school. Um, so I think that's kind of the perspective Ashley and I are also kind of overlaying. This is just one study, but again, this is an opportunity to kind of change the status quo, I guess, in some ways. Awesome. So as you guys can see from just a sampling of these uh, news headings, coronavirus and children with special needs have been a fairly frequent topic of conversation, which I think is actually really wonderful because a lot of parents in this community have faced so many burdens in getting supports for their child. And now the pandemic has really shown light on the needs that this community has. So um, these are just, as, I just did a quick Google search and these were just a handful that came up um, that I thought were interesting. So um, if I go to the next slide real quick, so I pulled out some of the comments that parents had made just in these news articles about their experiences during COVID-19. So parents have reported loss of key skills, 
um, both in terms of academic skills and also key skills that are important for just independent functioning. Um, kids are losing self-esteem because they are, you know, just their world has changed and they don't have that same support system. Um, increased behavior problems and emotional dysregulation has been a huge issue parents have been talking about. Um, I've read a lot of kind of anecdotal reports of parents reporting their child having increased aggression and we're kind of regressing back to um, behaviors that they used to have before a lot of these therapies helped them. Um, sleep issues, um, loss of therapies, stalling of developmental progress. These are all things that parents across the country are experiencing. Um, and what's really interesting is that, so the news, the way that the research world works, it, it, it moves very slowly. You, you do your research study, you submit it to be reviewed, they send it back and you, um, you edit it and you kind of like go back and forth. So it can take a long time for research studies to get out to um, kind of talk about what, what's happening. So I've been really looking to the news to um, have a better understanding of parent experiences. And it's really showed that parents are, are really struggling right now. There was a couple of studies that have come out um, in, in the world of academia, if you wanna move on to the next slide. Um, so researchers have found that kids are having all sorts of trouble too. They're, they're struggling to access virtual services. Um, again, that issue of increased behavioral and emotional issues has been kind of well cited in the research and in the news world. Um, increased, also studies have recently come out showing that kids with special needs um, have increased adverse outcomes from COVID-19. There was a study that just came out a few weeks ago saying that children um, that have special needs actually die at a higher rate when they have COVID than kids um, who are typically developing. So that's an extra layer of all this, of kind of the whole back to school argument of do you want to send your child into a space where they could potentially be compromised? Um, in, they could potentially are at increased risk of being of getting sick. Um, so that's another stressor. Um, and that's interesting too, because if you um, see a lot of the debates, it's to get the special education students in the building quicker because yeah. they're so afraid that, you know, that, that there's certain things that just work much better yeah. when you're in, in person, but at the risk of what, right? So, you know, it's like when, um, you're pregnant and you get a cold and you have to weigh out, are my symptoms, you know, worse than the possible effects it might have on my child, you know? And I think yeah. that like thinking about that and that risk assessment, um, it really becomes uh, so important for our decision makers to really think about that. I think that's such an important point, Rebecca. I think that it just shows how complex this issue is for kids. It's not just the loss of services and the loss of the critical kind of social supports that they have. It's also, these kids are oftentimes immunocompromised and they're at higher risks of, of getting pneumonia, of getting different kind of respiratory issues. So we have to be, we have to be careful for both protecting their health um, physically, but also their developmental health. Um, and I think that just adds an immense stressor to parents too. It's not just, I have to do all this at home. I have to balance that stress of knowing that my child has to wear a mask more often, has to you know, be really, really diligent with these like social distancing and health behavior measures um, because they are at increased risk for many kids. Um, I think that leads into that next point of increased demand on caregivers. Um, and then also, I think as we've all experienced loss of critical routines, Routine, what's that? <laughs> and I feel like yeah. I finally this week figured out a fall schedule. And then at seven o'clock last night, I'm sitting down to dinner and we got the email that now we're going to be in going full remote. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, okay, now I have to call that person to take care of my son. I think we're good there. Like, it's just that flexible piece is just, I almost need to paint it on the wall so I don't forget that like this is going to continue to, yes. to change. And um, for kids that rely on those routines and consistency, it's just really hard right now for everybody. Yeah. yeah, and I think you hit the nail on the head there. You know, I you're getting your kid ready for a certain expectation, for a certain schedule, for a certain routine. Maybe you're reading social stories, you're really preparing him. 
and then something changes and now that's not going to happen. It's going to be this other thing. And so, again, our kids might not adjust as quickly as um, kids who don't have some of the uh, expectations that our kids have, right? So, yeah, that's another piece of that, that things are, I think, the, the disparity, if you will, between some of the experiences our kids have and, and kids without exceptional needs might have. And it was so, it was such an interesting feeling as a parent because last week was very stressful and trying to manage, okay, if I'm going to do this, this is what it's going to look like. And then I sat down and I don't even know if I was relieved or not. I was just kind of done. Like I just yeah. feel done. I think I'm very much approaching that burnout. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, you know, where are we putting our time? You know, should I really be cutting down more from some of this professional development that I've been in doing and I love because I really should get on the ABCs, you know, uh, and it's just making those choices, um, you know, no matter what your situation is. It just is such a challenge and it constantly changes. So if anyone else, um, if, you know, think about it, you know, we're going to give you some time to, to, to think, but what other challenges have you experienced? What have you noticed? Um, what would you like to continue to kind of talk about today? We do have, we still have some amazing inf information. Um, but we want to make sure that we're um, using your time wisely as well. And so feel free to write in the chat or you can unmute yourselves as well. Yeah, I would love to hear, especially from the, the providers. I hope we have some parents in the audience too. Just what have you noticed both as a provider and what have you noticed as a parent? Um, I think that we have to look at both sides to really make sure that we're taking care of our community in the way that it needs to be taken care of. But I think while people are thinking, um, one thing that I just thought of that um, one of my teaching mentors used to tell me a lot when I first started teaching is to ask myself, like, think about the expectations you have for your child. Is that something you as a grown adult can do? Because if you can't do that, then you shouldn't ask, you know, your kid out to do that. And I always think about, you know, especially like in remote learning, I, I can't sit still for more than 45 minutes. I, I'm one of those people, I move around when I'm talking. I, you know, I used to teach in the class, my kids had made fun of me because I would just make circles and circles and circles because I couldn't sit still. So I can't expect a child with ADHD, a child with any sort of special need to sit at their computer for eight hours a day. Um, we really have to be kind to both ourselves and we have to be kind to our children and understanding the expectations we have for them right now. For sure. All right, we will move on, but mm -hmm. feel free to continue to um, share your, your thoughts. Okay, so now we're going we're to get into the actual study, which I'm so excited to see what you were able to gather. Awesome. I see a couple people comment. I just oh, want to wait. take a look at their. I'm oh, so sorry. How do you know that you're special in students are learning? Okay, I'm gonna answer one question at a time. Um, so, Mohammed, how did I know that my special needs students are learning? I was all about the data, 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 data. I wanted to know where they were when they're coming in, where they were when they, you know, after each lesson. And then every two weeks, I would give them an assessment. So I am not sure if you have used something like an exit ticket, or we used to call them kind of like end of like an end of class kind of assessment. It can be two questions, three questions that really get at the the core of your lesson. Um, I found that really helpful because I was able to look after class and say, okay, students A, B, C got the concept. Students D, E, F we're almost there and students HIJ really didn't understand it. So the next day I was able to kind of make groups um, and push kids forward based on that knowledge. So I always encourage um, the use of data and tracking kids progress so you really know where kids are at. 
And that was something that we talked about in episode five with the IEPs, the goals, objectives. There's so much that people have, have shared. So if you're looking for a document or some way to actually keep track of things, by all means, reach out. Um, I kind of have started a Google Drive of just everything that I'm finding. I'm just mining um, any resource that I can find. Um, not just for my own use, but to share with this community here. So uh, please reach out if you know you're feeling like you need a little bit more there. I think that's so great, Rebecca. I think that my biggest my my biggest soapbox that I will stand on is really strong goals for our kids. You know, I think if you hold kids to high expectations and you you set the expectation that they're going to work hard, but you're going to help them and provide them with the support they need. Kids can totally surprise you. They're capable of so much. So when we have really strong objective, you know, rigorous for that child goals, we set kids up to succeed. So that's and, nice. <laughs> and, 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 and that was one of the things too, that came out with the remote learning aspect, mm -hmm. communicating those goals very explicitly with the parent and depending on the ability, the child, so that sometimes I feel like our goals are something that sit in a binder on the shelf and yes. we know, know them and we know how we're assessing them. But getting the parents and the child on board is so important. And I've seen that with my own child because his speech used to be done at the daycare. So mm -hmm. I would get the report, but I wasn't seeing what exactly was hap happening now it's me and my husband and luke and we're at the table and we're doing it together and so um it's really i think helped me to see that and now i'm going to take that and apply it to my stu students as well uh, making sure goals are skill-based and not too yeah. broad absolutely christy i couldn't agree more um and we also had a comment um from deb um, she's very curious to see what mental health and physical illness correlations are um, involved with with COVID, um, you know, and that's coming mm -hmm. from a school psychologist and a parent of a teen um, who is currently attending an alternative high school. Um, I have a couple thoughts on this. Uh, Heather is truly the expert in this realm. So Heather, did you have any thoughts on kind of COVID-19 and the connection between like physical illness and mental health? Yeah, I think there's a couple of different pathways. One is a direct pathway, and that is that kids with um, chronic illness or special health care needs often have higher rates of mental health issues, symptoms, psychiatric disorders. Um, what some might call mental illness, um, just at baseline. I think the second piece is that um, kids in general who are dealing with some of the COVID-19 mitigation strategies being stuck at home are going to have a higher uh, level of uh, certain mental health symptoms, or they may be predisposed to mental health symptoms, and those symptoms will demonstrate an earlier onset, which means those kids might have started to have those symptoms anyway, um, but they come on a little bit earlier. Um, and one of the things about earlier onset is then that's more time away from sort of a symptom-free trajectory, right? And then when you think about those two things combined, now you get what we call an interaction, and that's where it sort of an, uh, amplifies both of those effects in kids who are experiencing both. Uh, so we already know kids with um, disabilities, kids with um, chronic health problems, while children in general have low risk for contracting COVID-19, those populations of kids have higher risk of contracting uh, COVID-19 and, and a higher risk of uh, morbidity and mortality, meaning more complications from the infection and higher rates of death. Um, again, kids in general compared to adults are more, more lower risk, um, but when you see the, the kids with the special health care needs and disabilities, then you're seeing a bigger disparity. And I think that's what is really one of the concerns for us is that these kids have uh, a bigger disparity from kids without um, chronic conditions or disabilities. 
Um, and so I think that's part of our concern here is that it's not only the risk of contracting COVID-19 that's higher, the risk of mortality and mor morbidity, but potentially a higher risk of the mitigation strategies of school closures and shelter in place because these kids might rely on some of those external resources more than kids without those special needs um, and at a higher percent, a higher frequency, right? So in addition to school, they likely are getting physical therapy, PT, uh, you know, PT, OT, speech. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's social groups or feeding in uh, motor and oral motor groups or oral motor sessions. So I think the, that our kids are just you know, sort of experiencing a, a trifecta, if you will, of of this um, situation, and I and I think that's one of the reasons too for for us to try and communicate to policymakers that this is a group that we need to focus on. Absolutely, um, you know, the idea that navigating everything for a child with special needs on a, a regular day is a difficult journey. Um, and this pandemic is just making it that much harder. Um, and I love this image, which was one <laughs> of the ones that was shared um, that was attached to the most recent study, correct? Yes, this was kind of our tagline. Um, and Debbie, I am going to hold off on your mental health specific question towards the end because I have a couple slides on that. So I just want to let you know that we're going to talk about that too. Um, but our, so our kind of tagline for, you know, this, this study was parenting and like navigating these services is so hard as it is. And then all of a sudden you throw coronavirus on top of it and it just makes it a million times harder. So, um, that's kind of our tagline. Um, we had a couple of questions that we wanted to know. So our first question is just simply how are kids receiving services during COVID-19? What does that look like? Are kids getting telehealth? Are they not? Are they not getting services at all? We just wanted to know what was happening. Um, our second question are, is, are parents satisfied with the services their kids are getting? Um, this is particularly important because parents are the ones delivering services right now. They are the ones that have to navigate and manage all of this. So if they're not satisfied, kids aren't going to be able to get the services that, the, the best possible services they can. And it's also going to put an increased burden on the family. And then third, we were interested in looking at, does the satisfaction differ by setting? So we had the privilege of talking to parents in the EI setting, early intervention, um, kids in special education, kids getting services in outpatient um, settings. And we wanted to see just how are these settings different and what can we learn from the different settings and how they, they're the, the kind of model of care that they have. Um, the fourth question we have is that are parents satisfied with this family provider partnership? And then our fifth question is, oh, just four. Um, so those are the, the main kind of things. They're really kind of an overview. We just wanted to know what's happening and how do parents feel about this? So um, our demographics, we were able to contact 207 parents. Um, we had a sample of 77% white, 74% married, and 76% with a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, it, it was a fairly homogenous population or sample, um, but we did definitely have some variability in there um, by like fa different family backgrounds. Um, and interestingly, we also had 26% of families that had two or more kids with a disability. Um, in terms of the kiddos that um, these parents were parenting, we were able, they had 276 kids total. And the most common diagnoses were ADHD, autism, developmental delay and sensory processing disorder. Um, and generally they attended public schools and, um, or they had, were not old enough to attend school. Um, and this nice little graph over here shows just kind of the breakdown of age. Um, this is basically just telling us that we had a pretty, pretty even split across different age groups, ranging from pre-K um, and before school and all the way up to high school. And so, so how are children receiving services during COVID-19? So overall, 45% of our kids had school-based services, 45% had outpatient services, and early intervention had, was 18% um, of our services. So kids can receive services across multiple settings, which is why these numbers don't add up to 100%. Um, we also were interested in just, you know, our kids receiving it via telehealth. Overall, 
um, for outpatient early intervention and multiple settings, it was um, at least you know 75%. So the vast majority of our kiddos were getting telehealth services. However, school kiddos were getting 47.7%. Um, or those kids were getting um, telehealth services, so that's less than half, um, which is pretty interesting, but also not totally unexpected, given kind of the rapid changes that schools had to make and the kind of wider focus that school-based services have beyond just um, addressing a, a child's um, functional needs. So what do you guys think about these numbers? Do you have any thoughts about kind of the role telehealth might play in services, any predictions on um, parent satisfaction before I show you guys the next slide. So I just have a quick reaction. Um, mm -hmm. I know that with the school, it was the guidelines of what we were supposed to do were so vague, right? So it wasn't very clear what we could do, what we couldn't do, what the kids were supposed to do. Um, you know, and it just led to lots and lots of phone calls and reaching out and sometimes even knocking on a door to make sure that the families were okay. And it truly was crisis education in just, are you okay versus giving them directed ser service? Absolutely. I'm curious to know how that is going to change now that we're kind of in the swing of things. This is the new normal okay we're still in a pandemic so we still want to check in and make sure they're okay but we also want to make sure no one regresses mm -hmm. so i would hope that that school that the telehealth would increase and that people would be more um open to receiving um whatever help they need in that way um i know the early intervention program that we're a part of they've been very great with communicating and making sure that um, we have access and that it was still protected and we have to sign waivers and make sure mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it's all done well. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know, do you have plans to do this like again, like to kind of see how the numbers change? Cause this was, when, when was this information gathered? So we collected data through, I think, May through about July. So that would be an interesting point. And it's part of the reason that I stopped data collection is that things have just changed so much since the beginning of the pandemic that it's a completely different story now. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something, you know, given that we have the time and the resources, we, we'd love to see, you know, how do these numbers change in the future now that we're, I guess, supposedly in the swing of things, even though it still feels like every, every day there's something new with COVID. So I will, do you wanna move on to the next sure. slide? Awesome, okay, so we asked kids, or we asked parents to tell us how kids were receiving services. So their options were via telehealth. Um, we also asked them if they were receiving it in person or if the providers were contacting fam the family or the, the child um, with assignments. So that would be like sending an email saying, hey, this is what you should do this week for your goal. Um, or, you know, this is kind of, this is what our weekly plan is, check in with me next week kind of thing. Um, so what we found is that um, across school settings, um, there were, a, this was pretty prevalent um, for, social work and occupational therapy. This is kind of the primary way kids were getting services. Um, also, you know, kids could receive services in multiple ways, but oftentimes kids perceived, you know, either kind of one modality, either telehealth or sending assignments or, you know, in person. So that's kind of, that's, that's a significant chunk of kiddos there that are receiving just assignments and not having a chance to really check in with their providers. Um, if you wanna to click to the next slide, um, if you look at outpatient and, oh, back one more. Thank you. If you look at outpatient and early in intervention, these numbers are much, much lower. Um, and, you know, I think we do have to be, you know, as, as a former special education teacher, I totally understand that providers in the special education world have a huge burden on them. They have, you know, they're managing not just, you know, these goals, they're managing standardized test scores, they're managing school compliance, all these other things. Um, but I think we also do have to weigh that this is kind of 
the most equitable and accessible way kids are getting services. Um, a lot of families don't have the resources for outpatient um, therapies or a lot of families even you know, once you turn three, they don't have access to early intervention. So um, those are just kind of things to weigh. But this is kind of, to me, a little concerning that these um, kids, you know, 51% of kids receiving OT didn't really have that kind of face-to-face -face contact with their provider. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide. So in this slide, I found pretty concerning overall, too. These are kids not receiving services at all during the pandemic. Um, and I'll start with the positives with outpatient. So it looks like overall, um, you know, less 20% or less of kids weren't receiving um, service, were, yeah, were not receiving services. So, you know, it's to be expected that some families, you know, would not want to would discontinue services for the pandemic or for a lot of other reasons these might stop. But what is concerning is looking at school and early intervention, the, the sheer number of kids not receiving services. So especially for looking at feeding therapy and school settings, 67% of kids aren't working on those skills. In social work, 50% of kids aren't working on those skills. Um, especially for kids in early intervention, this is, this is a big deal because they're developing at such a fast rate. Um, they really need those like, kind of, you know, con con cohesive services and um, they really need to be working on these skills. Um, and Heather, feel free to jump in here if you have any kind of comments on the impact of not receiving services. Okay, will do, thanks. Um, if you wanna to flip to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So how is your child receiving therapies? I know we have a lot of um, providers here and educators. If you wanted to talk about what you've been doing too, that's totally, that would be awesome. I also see Debbie said here, um, some parents may still remain detached from the process and unsupportive. I think elementary age students are more successful with teletherapy because parents are more involved at that stage. Um, I, I, I can definitely see this. I was a high school teacher when I was teaching. I think to add on to that narrative though, we wanna make sure that we're taking a kind of like a lifespan view of the parental experience though. If you have been sitting at IEP meetings for 10 years where people just kind of talk at you and they tell you this is what's wrong with your child, this is what we're gonna do, and you haven't had a voice, that is a lot of reason why parents are disengaged with older, with kids that are older ages. Besides, you know, like trying to increase independence for their child, it's also we have to respect that they've had a lot of, they've been burned before. They've had a lot of issues in the past with these systems. Um, so I think that we really need to, for those for those parents, understand wh what their perception of special education services are, and we need to understand what their needs are. What are their priorities for their child, and how can we make them an equal member of this team, as opposed to just continuing to talk at them and to tell them, you know, this is what's wrong with your child. Um, because ultimately, as our kids leave the special education system, they become adults, and their main support system is going to be their parents. So they need to be prepared to kind of step in and advocate for their kiddos. I think too, and I mentioned this in one of the other shows, but I remember being on the receiving end when they were going through the data for my son and my brain just kind of shut off, right? Yeah. It was like, what, 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 wait, what? Like, cause I was shocked, right? So I think too, add a pandemic to the mix of this and there has to be, I guess what I'm thinking of is like good bedside matter, yeah. right? We want to make sure that we're checking in. We want to make sure that the students are getting what they need. But also, what does the family need? And it's almost like that social work piece actually really shocked me. Because I feel like if any of, of them, that would be the higher um, percentage of service. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, though, is that because of lack of access to social workers? That's a great question. I um, So those were actually calculated based on kids who are receiving those services. Um, but I think also too, that brings up a great point of probably social workers had to step in and say, are you okay? Are you guys functioning? Their priority really shifted from Christ, you know, like here's here's my the skills we're working on to, I have to manage crises for all these families now. Oh, we are truly international. <laughs> so not only do we have someone from Morocco today, we also have someone from Argentina. Um, I would love to know, um, you know, what your role is and perhaps, you know, what 
brought you here today so that we can have um, a conversation. And feel free to um, unmute yourself too if you, you'd like to uh, share. I would love to hear too about your experiences in different countries. You know, the U.S. has very specific special education policies and procedures and practices. I am always fascinated to hear about how they differ, you know, in different, even different areas of the country and different areas of the world. And we love our librarians um, because I know so many of my students, that is their safe space. That's where we're going to go to calm down. That's where we're going to see a friendly face, a smile. Many of the librarians know my students, you know, inside and out and what books they're and, you know, and going to, to love. Um, so you are a wonderful resource and we really appreciate all that you do to help us because sometimes we need the 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 uh, break too so um which is something i'm gonna miss about being remote so i'm curious yeah. how you know perhaps you are connecting with the students and how teachers are bringing you into the classroom because i'm sure the kids would also love to see your faces as as well um you know, it, that's the thing I think that breaks my heart the most is that that com that idea of school as community, and it's not just about the math and the language arts, but it's seeing your colleagues and the kids and that social piece. And even if we went back tomorrow, we are not going to have that for quite some time. So in you know, so there's a little bit of like a grief there. But then what I think that we can do is think of other innovative ways to have those informal spaces. Um, and that's what we talked about last week as well. How do you create that community so that that part of education that's so um, important and special, um, you know, that just can't, not, can't always be reinvented mm -hmm. through a screen. Oh, I love that, Jean. I do too. That's so Jean sweet. Snail mail, right? Remember, well, let's hope the U.S. Postal Service is still around. Um, <laughs> but, you know, connecting to the kids to let, to letting them know physically through a piece of paper, imagine that, that we're here. Um, you know, I, I do think that that is really important because even though we're connecting through screens, it's not the same. Um, I know a, a couple kids I went, cause I didn't hear from them. I went and knocked on, on doors and face mask and distance, mm -hmm. but it was like, hi, like it just was, it was so nice to see yeah. them that you almost forget what that feels like, you know? Um, and I can't imagine the families that are dealing with, with so much and not yeah. being able to connect with, your families in, in, in the same capacity. Um, it's just, it, there's so many layers to this. Um, I think just having a community to share with is just so important right now because it's not going to be the same, right? We're going to have to make adjustments, um, but it doesn't mean that it has to be a failing system. It doesn't mean that it, it, it's not going to happen. Um, it's just that being creative and coming together and really supporting each other in different ways. Um, but anyway, we have about 15 minutes left. So I definitely want to get to the rest of your information since you've, you know, worked so, so hard on this. Yeah, so for the sake of time, I think I'm going to, let's kind of go through these graphs really quickly okay. and we can talk about the overview at the end. Um, but yeah, so overall, um, as I think no one is surprised, f almost half of the parents were not satisfied or had low satisfaction with their services. 36% were at medium, and then this lucky 21% um, had high satisfaction. So if we go to the next slide, um, we were able to break this down by type of setting and I thought this was really interesting. So um, overall kind of these these gray graphs or, or these gray bars are um, high satisfaction. The orange is medium and the blue is low and my biggest takeaway from this slide is this low section right here for school. Um, almost 
over 70% of kiddos or 70% of families had low satisfaction with school-based services, um, which I think is really, it's, that's important to keep in mind. All right, if we go to the next slide. So I'm gonna skip this for now, just for the sake of time. Um, so then the next question we asked was, um, family, how satisfied, excuse me, how um, satisfied families were with um, the family provider partnership. And that's kind of the idea that families and providers are working together as a team, as opposed to, you know, working in silos. So we um, had a measure that had an overall score, which is the set of bars on the left. The middle is um, kind of a focused on child's focus skills. So the, I'm satisfied with how my provider helps my child learn or something like that. And then family focus skills are more kind of like supporting the parents. So like um, the provider, I'm satisfied with the provider's use of words I can understand. So overall, um, the, the takeaway here is that um, it's decreased. They're still, they're still in the satisfied range. This line here represents kind of that transition from satisfied to um, unsatisfied. Um, and we see that um, this child focus data here during the pandemic, these kiddos, um, are the parents are less satisfied with um, the child focus scores, which I think makes sense. I, I tend to see that parents focus more on their child's needs than their own needs. Um, so I can imagine parents saying like, oh, it's fine. I I'm happy with what we're getting now. But um, overall, they're less satisfied um, or they're kind of, appro they're approaching dissatisfaction um, with the child focus skills. And I think two of the things to think about in terms of implications of this data, in terms of two of the things that Ashley just covered, is one is 70% of the families in, that are receiving school-based school services are unsatisfied, but that is the vast majority of where kids get services. So that's a huge group of people. Um, maybe not in our study per se, but in general. So if those the, the biggest provider of those services is, is providing unsatisfactory level of services. That's a concern on a public health level, right? And then I think the second piece about what you said, Ashley, that's really important is that um, sometimes families don't know what they don't know. So there may be a ton of benefit that they could be getting in terms of tips and skills in terms of working with their child at home, but they just, ha nobody's told them that. So I think while it's good that they're not dissatisfied and that they're still in the satisfied range, I think it's also important to take that with, within the context of what that may mean. That may mean in terms of the overall satisfaction, like you're saying, Ashley, or the, the services they're getting for their child, that they might not know the coaching and the um, skills that they could actually, a provider could be using with them to help them to be more effective in the home with, the, with their own child. Yeah, I think to satisfaction data is really interesting because it's not necessarily quality. It's, you know, looking at kind of parent perception of services. Um, and this also doesn't account for, you know, different, different expectations. Parents also could be rating this as higher levels of satisfaction because they're being more accommodating providers. They're, they might be saying like, oh, given the context, I'm satisfied with this. Um, so we do really have to kind of take that into consideration, but also be aware that um, it is important to keep in mind that parents are satisfied with this and that they are able to access this because parents, you know, when they're satisfied with services are going to be more involved and they're going to be more hands on. And that's what we really need for these services to excel. Um, and so this kind of, I'm going to go over this slide pretty quickly, um, kind of a general trend we saw that the gray bars represent during COVID if they're less satisfied, but really, again, the school, the school section right here is where the satisfaction has dropped the most. Um, early intervention providers are really, um, they're really rocking. They're, if we kind of look at these error bars, if we were to run a, a test with like a statistical test, they wouldn't be any different. Um, and same with the outpatient. So providers are really doing a good job managing parent satisfaction in these settings. Um, however, in school, there's really been a disparity. Um, and these were some of the items in the measure we used. So parents were most, uh, most satisfied with providers' friendliness, um, their use of words that they understand, respecting families' privacy, and then also showing respect to their families' values and belief, um, which I think is great to hear. However, in terms of what they weren't satisfied with, 
um, if you go ahead and click real quick, they were not satisfied with providing services that met the individual needs of their child and also helping the parents gain skills or information to get what the child needs. Um, and I, I really want to emphasize this last point here. I think that this really fits in with what Heather just said about um, kind of parent training and getting parents involved. We really need to be focusing on training parents to be able to implement this in their day and giving them the skills and what they need to really support these services. It's so crucial right now. Um, and this kind of shows us that there is a need there in that, in that domain. So I think at what time is it right now? 1.50? Um, yeah, so um, I have a couple of things, um, especially so for you, Heather. So you've brought up, you know, the importance of connecting with policy. What can we be doing to share this information with the people that need to hear it, that don't have a finger on the pulse of the special needs community? How do we get what we need for the upcoming years? You know, we don't dot, 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 however long. Um, because what you said was that this is not just, you know, this is a right now thing, but it is a thing that we need no matter what, pandemic excluded. Like, we still need these serv services for the children to be successful, to be you know, contributing and citizens to have an independent life. And these have all been things that have been overlooked in the past years. We started to gain traction. Now what um, Ashley said was it kind of like this whole pandemic has just taken the mask off of um, all of the burdens, right? And now we can't ignore them. Um, so what mm -hmm. can we do? Yeah, so that's a great question. And um, I think there's a couple of different layers of what, what people can do. So at the individual level or family level, you can write to your Congress represent congressional representatives, right? And say, hey, this policy, these policies are important to me. They're, you know, we really have to think long term. I think um, when people hear from their constituents about issues that um, are compelling and we can make an argument for why it would benefit them to think about these um, ideas and uh, big P policy, right, policy that they are in control of writing, um, that uh, they're, they're interested to have that information. Um, the second piece is with your local school districts and local school. And some of the times we call those small P policy because it may not be changing the official policy of the district or of the U.S. Department of Education, but they can improve things for their, their kids because they do actually have a lot of control over that. Um, and then I'm going to actually turn the bigger P policy question to Ashley, since she was kind of living in that world as a special ed teacher might have a better sense of the inner workings there. Um, but then the higher level of policy, that's kind of what we're trying to do too is really get that research out there so then we can get that research in the hands of policymakers so they can make informed decisions. And, um, you know, some things that just individuals are doing are really getting noticed. I don't know if people have seen the video of the uh, young woman with Down syndrome who's like, hey, some of these things don't make sense. Like, why don't we get paid minimum wage for the work we do? And, you know, there's a lot of people who didn't even know that. And so now people are like, oh, wait, you don't get paid minimum wage. That's not right. Okay, let's, let's do something about that. So I think a lot of it is, I know as, as cliche as it may sound, a lot of it could be building awareness in that these things need to be thought of, first of all. Um, but in terms of actual real change, I'm actually going to pump that to Ashley since she lived that world and is kind of bridging that right now um, with her work. Um. Yeah, that's something I think a lot about. Um, I think, you know, when it, think, when it comes to change, a lot of times it can be very scary. And I think, um, I, I just watched the documentary on Netflix, Crip Camp, and it is fantastic. If you have not seen it, absolutely 100%, you need to watch it. It is so great. Um, and I, I, you know, I have my master's degree in special education. I live in this world, and there was things that I didn't know that um, I learned in the documentary which just shows us how little we know about kind of disability history. But I think it's really important that, you know, this community 
recognize that they have a powerful voice. We, you know, oftentimes um, the disability community is considered to be kind of like the silent um, minority, but they have a voice. There's there's a lot of a lot of us in this community here, um, whether it's parents or children or adults with special needs. Um, so just communicating what your needs are, showing you know, starting conversations. Um, you know, just like how we you know we, we've talked a lot about you know race and gender recently and um, sexual orientation, all sorts of different parts of identity, and giving those different voices now. The same thing needs to happen with disability. So you know feel empowered that you are the voice for your students, you are the voice for your children. Um, if you are an individual with a disability, you have a voice that deserves to be heard. Um, so share that on social media, share that with your school district and share that with, you know, people making these policies because it's, to me, it is completely a crime that IDEA isn't funded completely. It's a crime that people aren't getting paid what they deserve to get paid because we are all human beings and we all deserve that basic respect. Um, but those things aren't going to change if we just go along with them and we let the, the status quo kind of sit as it is. So um, I was kind of a pain in the butt when I was a teacher because I was always advocating for my kids. And, you know, they were always the ones that would be kind of pushed off to the side or they'd have to go, you know, oh, we're going to do testing in the lunchroom or all these things that were just inconvenient. And I would, you know, march into the principal's office and be like, no, that is not going to happen. We're going to rework the schedule right now because my kids need to be there because they're high school students too. Um, so don't be afraid to speak up. That's the best advice I have in just communicating to as many people as you can. You are speaking my language. Um, I just love that <laughs> so much. Um, there was a couple things that you said. First of all, Crip Camp was fantastic. Yes. Um, I have Jude, Judy's book here, um, Be, Being hu Human. Um, so she was one of the members in the documentary that kind of led it. Um, like my hero and I have Amazing. a master's mm -hmm. in special ed. Maybe I it was like in a lesson somewhere. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what they did and how they sat in and they were there for weeks yeah. and traveling and like, it was incredible. And I'm so happy that they did take the footage and it's now in the mainstream, but you know, that was what nine what's the year that they actually sat in? It was 75, I think, right? Five, right? Yeah. That was the initial of all, mm -hmm. all the kind of laws. And it's just, um, it's powerful because, you know, when you become a special education teacher, I know there was a big push in um, my kind of cohort. Um, you know, you think of one type of person right? You think of maybe it's autism or you think it, and it encompasses yeah. so many more individuals yeah. and so many who have managed without the services. Why wouldn't we want to make it better for the future? It wasn't easy for her in the beginning, but she pushed ahead and got things done so that the people behind her can have the things that she wish she she had right and i think that's such a powerful thing too that you know change takes a while to happen and right now we're looking for instant fixes and unfortunately this has kind of showed us there's been a lot wrong for a long time and it's not that it's been ignored it's just kind of we've been we make do with what we have right if you're a parent with a child with, with special needs, you do what you can for some, sometimes you're living day to day. Well, now the whole world has lived and has felt what it means to kind of have that uncertain day to day. So uh, my hope is that that empathy has now grown and that like, oh, wow, like I didn't, I never thought of it that way. And I do think it's awareness. Um, if any of you are connected with your council for exceptional children, um, the legislative summit that they held this summer was fantastic. Um, I will post uh, some of uh, those letters on the Learning Revolution site because what's great is that they already have the prefabbed letter and a way for you to find who your congressional person is to actually, you can pers personalize that and then send it. 
um, which is um, a really great thing. And then also Council for Exceptional Children is international. Um, and so to reach out to your local chapter, there's lots of advocacy res resources there. Um, and just to connect with others that are feeling the same way, because if you're having a thought, um, I used to say in high school, it was like my little thing, we're commonly unique. Everybody's special, but if you have a thought, I guarantee you there's someone else out there who has a similar thought. You just might not have connected with them yet, right? So, um, and I think that's true in the advocacy world too, um, that, you know, if you're feeling like, oh, I just wish there was something else, find that person that is going to join the team and go on the march, um, and uh, when you look at the, the, the numbers of those that do have disabilities, if you, you know, look on your state or there is also a database on the national level, you're going to be surprised as to the large range, right, of um, and people that deal with things that you might have not even known existed. Um, and I just think um, having that the empathy. I just come back to that piece. You know, if you've lived it, you know it. But if you have it, how can we help them to see what it's like and how can we get the change that needs to be changed? Um, but anyway, we are out of time. Feel free to hang around if you have some additional questions. Um, Ashley and Heather, I can't thank you enough. Please keep us updated on how the research continues and maybe we'll have to have another uh, check-in in, you know, a couple months to a, a year. So I am going to um, stop recording, um, but thank you again. And, I do uh, have one request, if you don't mind. We are, we are starting a newsletter of um, like tips and tricks and like updated with research. So if you guys are interested in being on that newsletter, um, throw your email into the chat and we will add you. Um, we're hoping to kind of start, you know, building this community so that we can all be in the loop more often. Fabulous. Awesome. Very good. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. But thank you so much for having us. It was such a great experience. Great. And um, we'll see you soon. Take care. Thanks, everyone.